Welcome to Journey to Justice. I'm Eiko Kosasa, your host. Today, my guest, Walter Ritty, needs no introduction. He is a well-known and respected activist for Hawaiian rights and for protecting the land. Back in the 1970s, Walter was one of the leaders of Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, a community organization fighting to stop the U.S. bombing of Kaho'olawe, a sacred island. Today, Walter, a homesteader, is organizing to stop the use of GMOs in Hawaii especially on Molokai, and to bring awareness to sustainability. He is also running for a seat in OHA, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs in 2012, to bring these issues to the forefront of our community discussions. I began the interview by asking him where he was born and raised. My name is Walter Rudy. I'm from the island of Molokai. I was actually born on Maui, and when I was really a young baby, I moved to Molokai, and I've been living there ever since on the island of Molokai. And right now, um, I live on a homestead in Ho'olehua mm -hmm. on, on Molokai, and raising my family over there. Yeah, earlier you were saying on how you, you're like a farmer to grow food for your family, so you, what do you grow, raise? Well, I'm raising a lot of fruit trees, a lot of Hawaiian uh, plants and trees, uh, vegetables. I have a windmill. I have photovoltaics. My wow. hot water heater is just a plexiglass tank, 40 gallon tank with no moving parts. It's been working for the last 25 years, giving me hot water with no problem. Um, it's, it's like we've been off the grid. Yeah, and wow. it's, it's being really interesting. It changes your whole way of living and your whole way of thinking, you know. Yeah. So coming to Oahu is a pretty big deal for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, shock to the way we live here. <laughs> yeah. So how did you come to political consciousness? Yeah, you know, it's like I went to Kamehameha schools and graduated. So you were ordered. Yeah, I, I lived at, on campus for six years of my life. Uh -huh. and and graduated from Kamehameha schools and basically the school was preparing us um, to be successful in the new the new regime that was coming to Hawaii which said that we couldn't speak pidgin you know that we couldn't speak Hawaiian that we had to become part of the mainstream and become part of the melting pot and then be successful to, to be successful in this new place so that was the goal for, uh -huh. for our class anyway, the 63. So when we went through school, um, the history we were taught was all European, American, you know, feudalism and the Greeks and everybody else, but nothing about being Hawaiian. Yeah. Um, in fact, when we graduated, there was no such thing as an overthrow. Uh -huh. I didn't even know there was a queen named Lilio Kalani. Yeah. So this was like, between then and now, a huge leap of what I know and what other people know about the history of Hawaii and who Hawaiians were and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, it's, been, it's been a growing thing yeah. for me and everything started after I graduated from Kamehameha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then I started learning who I was and what Hawaiians were all about when I went back home again to Molokai and I got hooked up with all of the elders, the kupuna. And the reason I got hooked up was because I was getting into a lot of trouble because I was a hunter. I fed my family not only by growing stuff and going in the ocean, but I was also a hunter. Uh -huh. So the deer didn't pay attention to the no trespassing signs. So uh -huh. I had to follow the deer and I got into a lot of trouble. Uh -huh. So that made me ask questions to the kupunua. You know, it's like, how come you guys, because they told us stories. Oh, this is what we used to do, and this is where we used to go, and these are things. And I said, well, well, how did you guys go over there? Because now we cannot, we couldn't go to those places because mm -hmm. they were like fences and gates and signs that cut off our access to the places that our kupuna went. And they went there to go get fish, they went there to hunt, they did those things. So we said, well, what happened? The questions in our mind became, wow, what happened? How come we cannot go when they could go? Yeah. So they had a lifestyle where they were feeding their families by going to get the natural resources, but we couldn't do the same thing. So 
the question became why and how come and that's when we started getting politically involved because yeah. we wanted to know why couldn't we go on that road anymore right. who put up those gates and why did they put up those gates and then what rights did they have to put up those gates what rights do i have to have that access and that that was the beginning of us learning more and more and more and more and more wow so it, it was a matter of survival yeah yeah but it's powerful because it is it's, yeah, it's, like, it's not this intellectual thing only yeah yeah i, I mean but we had to make friends with lawyers yeah, because we were help. like on the edge of being almost illegal in everything we were trying to do because of all these new rules and new ways that was was in our land so yeah today many of those those lawyers are now judges <laughs> so we had some really good lawyers helping us you know teaching yeah. us what were land rights first of all and what other indigenous peoples had these kinds of land rights mm -hmm. and then what were hawaiian rights and mm -hmm. hawaiian land rights and then we learned about hrs-7 of access rights right. and we got to the point where we got so involved in trying to survive that we ended up um, not only on the island of Kaholawi, but right after Kaholawi, we ended up at the 1978 Constitutional Convention. Oh, right. And in there, we pushed Article 12, Section 7 to create a constitutional right of access for the Hawaiians to recognize our rights so that we were ensured that we could go and do these things forever and ever. Wow. So it was, it was a progressive yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's all those steps. Yeah. Can we backtrack a little bit? So how did you get interested or involved with PKO, Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana? Because you were one of the leaders in the right. organization. Um, so because we needed access on yeah. Molokai, we formed a group called Hui Alaloa. Mm -hmm. So we got people together and we started talking together and we organized. Mm -hmm. So organizing is critical if you're going to go anywhere. It's hard to do things by yourself. Yeah. So we organized Hui Alaloa. And we decided, and in that organization, we brought in our elders, and we got all of the old stories, and we found out that there were old trails that Hawaiians had rights on. And that Kamehameha the first, uh -huh. he, his proclamation, Mamalahua Kanavai, was the first law that was punishable by death that Kamehameha instilled on, on, on the people. Right. And that law guaranteed everybody the right and the safety of using these trails. Wow. Because without the access, people couldn't survive. So he was smart enough to know that people needed to be protected when they went out to feed their families. Because yeah. he was the guy that went and made trouble with some of the fishermen. And he, they hit him over the head because he didn't have his cape and stuff because he was in the ocean. And hit him on the head with their paddle. Mm -hmm. because he, and, and they ran because his men came. And Kamehameha sent out an edict to bring these people to him. And they thought they were going to get killed. But instead he said that he's going to pass this new edict that you cannot bother people have the right to have safety in these areas where they're, where they're feeding their families and the rights to use the trails in safety around all of the islands. Right. So that's the, that's the law that we based our group on. Right. So that what became our emblem. And then from there we went on to to learn of other rights right. of, of access and stuff that we had that was passed down, but not only by Kamehameha, but, but his sons, Kamehameha III and all of those things, all the way down to today, these laws are still there. Right. So people here don't realize that, that the Hawaiians have different laws that supersede the existing laws and that these laws were set up so that the Hawaiians could survive because they knew what was happening this new influx of laws and people that were coming to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. So when you guys were organizing there, but how did you link it to stop, because you have to stop the U.S. military to... Yeah, okay, so, so the, lead, right? the lead to Kahaolave wasn't really our, our plan. Like we were doing these things. When we did, when we tried to open up the trails, we had to, we had to organize into a big group. We had like 200 people on Molokai, and that's a lot of people for Molokai. Wow. And we marched on the trails. And we said, we're marching on the trails as a show that we have these rights. And we became media people. I mean, the, the newspapers came, there was even a helicopter following us. 
and we, 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 we went statewide. Hawaiians were actually marching. This is like first time Hawaiians ever marched. You know, Hawaiians are supposed to go, lovely hula hands and smile. And you know, that was supposed to be how you were supposed to act as a Hawaiian. You're supposed to be, quote, a nice Hawaiian. Yeah. And then now we're being like, oh, protesting Hawaiians, you know. So yeah. that, was big, that was a big deal back then in the 70s. So we got a call from people on Maui because they saw our action. And mm -hmm. we got invited to come to the Kaho'olawe protest. Oh. And our job was as hunters to provide the meat for the people who were going to invade Kaho'olawe. Oh. That's how we were just invitees. Oh. So when we got there, the military came with their helicopters and the guys in the other boats didn't want them to, to take their boats so they all rushed back to Maui. And we said, whoa, I was seasick. I said, I want to get off this boat, you know. <laughs> I don't want to go all the way back to Maui. <laughs> so we got uh, nine of us together on one boat that, that was happening to come by and they were full of reporters. We jumped on their boat and they took us to Kaholawe. Oh. And that's how the whole Kaholawe story started was yeah. by accident. We became the guys who actually landed while the rest of the guys went back. <laughs> and then... I was so seasick, I said, I'm gonna have to go to the mountains, you know, I gotta go relieve myself. I'm all, my stomach is all in turmoil. So I went into the bushes and Dr. Aluli saw me going in. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm gonna look around. So he and I both started just walking and we ended up on the top of the hill. We turned around and looked down and helicopters came, boats came and took all the guys on the beach and the rest of them took them off the island. Oh. And, and the two of us got left back. Yeah, that's how you spent the night. Right, right? we because spent three extra days with no water, no food, no nothing. And that's how the whole story of Kaho'olawe started. Well, good thing you lived on Molokai so you knew how to survive in that. Yeah, it was oh. no problem. Yeah. I mean, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like Molokai. Kaho'olawe is no different than Molokai. So yeah. we had a, uh, an easy time to be relaxed. Yeah. And we, we, we walked the whole island mm -hmm. and we got touched by that island. Mm -hmm. We got touched by the destruction and all of the devastation that was happening to that island. And that island called to us and said, I'm dying and you could see it. You know? So by the time we left and it took us with the helicopter, it, it, my, my life was totally changed. By the time that helicopter landed on Maui, I was a whole different person. That island just took hold of me and the, the rest is history you know it's like yeah. the united states military said no this is important for the security of the united states of america right. you know this island is critical to the national defense of, of the united states of america and we said no this you're killing our island you cannot kill our island so the elders told us that if you want to defeat the United States of America, there's only one weapon that can defeat the United States of America, and that's aloha. Oh. And we said, aloha, <laughs> but these guys are bad guys. And she said, well, we can kill them with aloha. I said, okay, and so we coined the term aloha aina. Yeah. So it wasn't anything had to do with hatred or anything. It was the love of the land that defeated the United States of America. We got them off the island. Wow. So that's that's the lesson of Kaolave is is the love of the land. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's powerful. <laughs> so that's that's the motivation and that's the same motivation that keeps me going, you know. It's like there's many things that are killing our lands and killing our resources. And in a, in the case of Kaolave you could see it. You could see the fires from the bombs. You could see all the goats eating up everything, and the devastation on the land was so, so in your face. 